thank you for choosing to watch It Is Written. We are in the seventh and last part of our series, Depression, The Way Out. And what a blessing it is to know that depression, which touches almost every family in the world, is not the end. There is a way out. God has so created the human mind that the human mind can actually repair itself and can find good mental health. Over the last several weeks, I have had the privilege of having Dr. Neil Nedley with me through that series. Dr. Nedley, I'm so thankful that you've joined us again to be a part of this series. Thank you. It's good to be here, Chris. Dr. Nedley is a physician of 27 years with a specialty in internal medicine, specializing in mental health and the difficult to diagnose patient. Dr. Nedley is also the president of Weimar Institute. And Dr. Nedley, just as a refresher for our audience, what is Weimar Institute? Weimar Institute is an educational institute, higher educational institute, has a college. But it also has a lifestyle center that we treat uh, diabetes, um, a lot of physical diseases, even cancer. And we also have an emotional health section uh, where we treat depression and anxiety recovery. Now, if someone were interested in Weimar Institute or those two recovery, or those two programs, the depression recovery or the New Start program, what are some websites that they might be able to go to to get more information? Yeah, for the depression recovery, it's simply depressionthewayout.com. Okay, that's an easy one. Yeah, and for the, the physical um, disease portion, that is newstart.com. Okay. And then for the college um, or the educational institutions, there's also a four-month training course that it, anyone can really be a part of. Okay. The lifestyle treatment of disease and that sort of thing. Uh, that is simply new star. I'm sorry, Weimar.edu. Okay. Weimar.edu. Wonderful. Now, in this last piece of our series, we are going to talk more about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. In fact, part six was all about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And just to maybe review a little bit, what is emotional intelligence? That's understanding our emotions and the emotions of others and responding to those in a healthy way. And how important is emotional intelligence or EQ? It has more to do with our success and happiness than even our IQ does. It has more to do with our success than even our IQ. Yes. So this is something we want to be listening. We want to be intent and understand what we're talking about when we talk about emotional intelligence. Correct. Now, what are some ways that a person can improve their emotional intelligence? Once we understand that it's our thoughts that cause our emotions and behavior, we can actually analyze our thoughts for distortions. And there's 10 different distorted ways of thinking that we teach people. And then after they recognize which distortion is present, then they have the chance to reconstruct their thoughts into what's true and accurate. And a good thought that is true and accurate will also be one to help us to achieve our goals and to help us to feel the way we want to feel. That's what we call a rational thought. Okay. And so it gets into analyzing our thoughts and correcting those thoughts. And in simple principles, as we talk about this, in our last show, we left off with this idea, stop or pause. That's right. And think. That's right. And then, and then what were those two words that you used uh, to describe how we change that thought pattern? Well, we have to be intentional and forceful to find evidence that supports a different way of thinking. Okay. So we stop, we pause. We're intentional and forceful and actually change how we think. And by changing how we think, mm -hmm. it changes how we feel mm -hmm. and in so doing allows us to achieve the goals that we have in life. That's right. Not only changes how we feel, but it changes our behavior once that happens as well. And, you know, one of the things I appreciated most about what you said there and what you have been saying is you've talked about an, a rational thought. And I think yes. even in one of the shows, I used the word positive thinking. Yes. Uh, and, and then you corrected that to rational thinking. And I like that because, you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of books written on the power of positive thinking and these kinds of things. We're not talking about some self-help 
stuff here, what we're talking about is practical, stopping, uh-huh. analyzing, uh-huh. and then actually changing how we think. Uh-huh. And one of the ways of doing this is to recognize when we have an irrational thought. Now, an irrational thought means that you're not feeling the way you want to feel. Mm-hmm. If you're not feeling the way you want to feel right now, there's irrational thoughts behind that. If you are not thinking in a way that helps you to achieve your goals, that's irrational. Or if you are thinking things that are just twisted and plain wrong, that's irrational. So if you, uh, those are little red flags. If people are going through their day and they're saying, I don't want to feel this way, mm-hmm. they've got an irrational thought. Or if they're recognizing, you know, I'm not sure I'm thinking accurately. I'm in this fog. I'm not thinking clearly. Then that would be irrational as well. So there's little cues that we can have to tell us it's time to stop. It's time to rethink and turn that irrational thought into a rational thought. And for those that maybe have not watched our previous programs, that effect or that ability to have a rational thought can be affected by a lot of outside influences. And so you're going to want to watch previous, they're going to want to watch the previous programs to help see what those outside influences are because if we're able to correct those, it's hard enough to think rationally sometimes when we have no outside influences controlling really or or impeding our thought process. Right. We put people on what we call the spa therapy first when they come to our depression and anxiety recovery program. And those are things that we are having them change lifestyle-wise to help their brain have better function, good exercise, good diet, light therapy, working on getting them adequate and restorative sleep. Uh, The hydrotherapy part is important. We even utilize massage. And so we're doing everything that helps this brain function. And then once the brain is able to function, that's when we start this process of analyzing their thoughts. And that's when things click and they're never the same again once they're able to get this down. Wow. Now, what are the characteristics of someone who has high emotional intelligence? Well, they're going to be curious about other people. Uh, They're going to be managing their emotions instead of being managed by their emotions. Okay. They're going to have good relationships, uh, and uh, they're going to be well-motivated to achieve their goals. They're going to be very interested in being a moral, um, good person. They'll know their strengths and weaknesses accurately. When they are upset, they'll know exactly why they're upset. If they do make a mistake, they will actually take responsibility for their mistake and Mm -hmm. grow from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, there's other attributes as well, but they're just great people to be around and they're people that are actually improving over time. Okay, so let's, we've made a lot of this practical. Let's look at some case studies. And uh, you and I have talked and uh, what better place to find case studies than in God's word? Because we see in the Bible actually some good case studies on emotional intelligence. Yes. Now, Dr. Nedley, any, any characters, any, any individuals in the Bible that come to mind that we want to talk about a little bit when we talk about emotional intelligence? Well, Saul had issues with his emotions. He was not feeling the way he wanted to feel. Okay, so we're talking about <laughs> King Saul yes. of the Old Testament, the first king of Israel. Right. Okay, and you said he's not having some good thoughts. Let's talk about that a little bit. What kind of not good thoughts is, uh, was Saul having? Well, he was having thoughts of anger and rage and jealousy and depression. He would go into severe depression and anxiety. Okay, and we see that. I mean, we see that in his dealing with David specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, David would become king after Saul, Mm -hmm. and he was jealous of David. He would get angry with David. But you said Saul was depressed. Mm -hmm. How did you? How do you know that Saul was depressed? Well, his counselors actually stated it. They said we need to find a a therapist uh, to help this man out. We don't know what to do with him. Uh, and uh, he actually was down, have felt hopeless. Uh, that's part of depression. Okay. And so how does he then begin to feel or begin to get better from that? Well, the music therapy did help him. 
to have rational thoughts. And by the way, music therapy can be helpful today. We utilize it in our program. Okay. Now, I want to hit a pause button there. You said music therapy, and we've briefly touched on that in these programs. Uh -huh. What do you mean by music therapy? Well, it needs to be melodious music. Okay. Uh, it needs to be, uh, the rhythm needs to be more subdued. You know, that's why harp is ideal for this. You know, you can't play the harp too loud. Okay. And it's, uh, it brings out melodies and harmonies much more than the rhythm. Uh, and uh, just focusing in on that can help calm the mind and balance it. Okay. So when we talk about music therapy, we're not talking about 80s pop. We're not talking about uh, rock music. We're not talking about heavy metal. No. We're talking about melodious music. You use the harp. What other kind of examples uh, for someone who's listening and saying, music can actually help me think better. Yeah. What other kind of music are we talking about? Well, uh, the music of Handel and Bach and, and uh, many of these composers. Actually, Handel wrote his music for a king that had depression. He understood music therapy. That's what the water music was about, to get the king out on the river get them outside in the light and, and um, you know, bring them down the river where well, all this music was to enhance his thoughts, and it worked. Okay. <laughs> so Saul goes through the music therapy, and it calms his nerves, mm -hmm. but does it solve all of his problems? Well, here's the issue. He had a cognitive distortion called magnification and minimization. Magnification mm -hmm. and minimization. Yes. Majoring in minors and minoring in majors, getting things out of proportion. Okay. Now, the first way he minimized things is when Samuel confronted him with mistakes that he had made. Mm -hmm. He minimized them and justified themself. Okay. And, you know, when a man makes a mistake and doesn't correct it, he's committing another mistake. Yes. And that another mistake is even worse than the first. Yes. Because he's doomed to repeat it. And so instead of acknowledging where he went wrong and taking responsibility, which is what an emotionally intelligent person will do, uh -huh. he minimized it. Okay. And then he began to magnify the discipline okay. that took place. He thought it was very unfair that his punishment outweighed the crime. Uh -huh. But yet the punishment was given by God. We know God is a just God. Yes. And a lot of people that dwell on being treated unfairly all the time yes. actually have been treated rather fairly. Yes. And Saul was treated fairly in this whole situation. Now we also need to understand that every human being is going to be treated unfairly at times. Absolutely. But when we're treated unfairly and we continue to rehearse it and dwell on it, that's going to lower our emotional intelligence significantly. Mm -hmm. So we should never dwell on how we've been treated unfairly and continue to rehearse it. And then the third aspect of this magnification is he magnified himself. Mm. And magnification of self, where we get into egotism and arrogance, Yes. We might actually feel better being arrogant at first, mm -hmm. but arrogance always comes before feelings of worthlessness. So first you have pride, then as a result you have wounded pride yes. later on, and then you begin to have these awful thoughts. And if you remember, they were coming in from a great victory. Yes. And the women were so glad to see them because they were alive and the women were going to be protected now. And, and so thousands of women came together to celebrate this homecoming. And they sang this song, Saul has slain his thousands, but David, David. his tens of thousands. Yes. And if Saul had not developed a sense of pride, elevated sense of self, yes. his pride would have never been wounded. He would have just put his arm around David and said, I put him in a position to succeed. Yes. And he would have been very glad to honor the all-star of the battle as well. Yes. But instead, his pride was wounded. Yes. And, you know, there's a great book. In fact, we recommend it. It's called What Your Counselor Never Told You, The Seven Sins That Lead to Mental Illness. It's mm. actually written by clinical psychologist William Backus. Okay. But he gives you a little test to see whether you might have pride. Yes. Or whether the viewer might have pride, mm -hmm. trying to be noticed, craving attention, yes. itching for compliments, yes. needing to be important, detesting the idea of being submissive, loathing the idea of admitting to wrongdoing, strongly opinionated, 
argumentative, uh, demanding and actually standing up for our individual rights all the time, and then thinking we have excellences we actually don't have. Mm -hmm. he, William Vacus says, watch out, if you have any of those or particularly more than one, pride is there and wounded pride will follow. And we know the, the end of the story for Saul is not a happy story. Um, uh, Saul never is, resolves his mental illness. He never took care of his distortions for more than a few days. He actually did for a few days. Yes. David actually became his, his clinical psychologist as well yes. and helped him to correct some of those distorted thoughts. Uh, but he didn't rehearse it, and that's the other thing. We have to practice this, yes. not just correct it once or twice. We need to practice it. And uh, as a result, when stress was coming in to his life, he demanded that God answer him the way he said he should. And by the way, beware of ever demanding that the Lord answer you the way you state that he, uh -huh. he should. Yes. Uh, because if he doesn't answer, chances are he's already answered. Mm -hmm. You're just not putting it into practice, yes. what he has stated. And then he went to the wrong counselor and beware of going to the wrong counselor. The wrong counselor gave him a lot of truthful information, but then gave him <laughs> some terrible untruths, and that is there was no hope for Saul that he had doomed himself, which wasn't true. Yes. There was hope right up until the end. And now with these feelings of hopelessness and stress coming in and his enemies coming in, he did what you would expect someone to do in that situation. He took Kills his own. own life, committed suicide, an unnecessary death had he taken care of the underlying distortions that were causing his mental compromise. Wow. Now there are many other examples we can go to, but Let's go to an example maybe that is a little bit more hopeful. Yes. And uh, let's talk about Elijah. Okay. Okay. Elijah. What, 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 how is Elijah a case study in emotional intelligence? Well, Elijah actually was not prideful. So everyone comes to depression for a different set of reasons. Yes. Uh, he actually wasn't like uh, another Bible character, Solomon, who was just trying to do fun things to obtain pleasure, which, yeah. of course, caused him to have a lot of lack of pleasure, yes. uh, which is very common today. Yes. Uh, but Elijah always wanted to follow the will of the Lord, so he was, he was a spiritual person. Um, he was really a whole person. He had a lot of great attributes. But after his tremendous victory on Mount Carmel, he yes. anticipated the entire nation was going to change, which actually they were on the precipice of changing. And then when his life got threatened by Jezebel again yes. and said he's going to be dead within 24 hours, you know, he did have a reason to fear her because sure. she had killed all the other prophets. Absolutely. Of the Lord. But instead of waiting on the Lord, which he had always done, he took off running for his life. And 30 days later, he asks the Lord to take his life. Mm. He wants to die. Yes. And, of course, the Lord had to put him on a depression recovery program. <laughs> Angels came and fed him food. I think there was some flaxseed in that meal. <laughs> uh, he was put on an exercise program to get out of the cave. He had light therapy. Um, and what really helped him, though, was the cognitive behavioral therapy where he began to have a dialogue and then as a result of that dialogue, distorted thoughts were found. And his distorted thought was overgeneralization. Yes. He said, I'm the only one yes. that has not bowed the knee to Baal. Yes. And the Lord let him get by with that the first time. But now when he repeats it, the Lord had to put him on pause and say, Elijah, you're just wrong. You're wrong by a factor of 7,000. What he should have said is, I'm the only one I know of. Yes. <laughs> But in reality, he just knew he was the only one. And that's why I tell people it's not what we don't know that hurts us so much. It's what we know for sure that just is not so. And so once Elijah corrected that, he still wasn't better until he followed what the Lord told him to do. The Lord told him to do three things, none of which he wanted to do. And this is very typical for my depressed patients. Normally, they want to do a lot of the things I tell them. There's usually one or two or three that say, uh, uh, uh. Okay. I don't really want to do this. But yet those are the crucial things that will get them over the hump. Yes. 
And Elijah trusted in the Lord that he did those three things, even though he had no predilection to want to do them. Yes. And not only did he recover from depression, he established the school of the prophets, and the Bible says he was translated without seeing death. That is an amazing story. Now, and not just a story, that is an actual event of biblical history. Any case studies, and we don't have a lot of time, Dr. Nedley, but any case studies of any patients that uh, you might want to share briefly of success on emotional intelligence? Yes, I'll share the story of Michaela. Uh, Michaela, like uh, many individuals that come to our program, suffered abuse at an early age. Okay. Um, actually, at age 13, she began to um, uh, be sexually abused by a friend. And uh, she, of course, didn't tell anybody about it. But this mm -hmm. beautiful, energetic girl that had all these positive things that everyone thought she was going to be a great woman um, started to spiral down, and nobody really realized what was going on. And so by the time she was 15, this guy had moved away. But she started to actually try to find her satisfaction in men, and she would go from one relationship to another, one breakup to another. And finally, um, she's in Cancun with the relationship that she finally thinks is going to work. It's a, she's working at a pharmacy as a tech. The pharmacy, uh, uh, head of the pharmacy, is now very interested in her and takes her to Cancun on this vacation. And while she's flipping through his um, mobile phone, the first morning there, she sees a provocative pose of another pharmacy tech just two days earlier. Wow. And she realizes, I'm not the only one. This is the same problem. There is no hope. And she tries to take her own life with the four pills. By this time, she's on four different medicines, been misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder and all of this. And so she ends up um, in the hospital, comes out of the hospital to his care, and then she does it with another medicine, which almost does take her life. About a week later, she ends up in our program, and she's ho feeling hopeless. She wants to die. Her parents don't know anything about what to do with her. Mm -hmm. So we put her through the spa therapy, and then we get to the thoughts. Okay. And what she had done is she had elevated this desire for men to actually be a need. Yes. And actually, to be happily married, we first must be happily single. And actually, we don't have to have a relationship in order to be happy. We That's have right. to be happily single first. Yes. So we taught her to be BP proof, in other words, boy proof. Okay. Uh, and she even had to learn how to dress differently in regards to that so she could work on being happily single. And she got rid of her distorted thoughts. Her feelings of hopelessness she recognized as a distortion. And um, she turned her life completely around. She is a happy girl. She's off all of her psychiatric medicines. Uh, she's now in PA school. And uh, she, her emotional intelligence is at the, near the top of the charts. So she's actually in much better shape now to be a successful person than someone her age who's never been depressed or anxious because she's learned the principles of mentally healthful living and she got rid of her magnification same thing that Saul had she was majoring in minors and minoring in majors she corrected that and so there's a way out there is a way out and even though life may have been unfair to us in reality, and not a distortion, but life has really been unfair and terrible things have happened to Michaela. Mm -hmm. She was able to take time, pause, analyze the situation, change her thought processes, mm -hmm. and actually get out of this rut mm -hmm. and now is living a life to its fullest. Exactly. And not letting life dictate to her how she should live. That's right. And Dr. Nedley, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it would seem that that is really what emotional intelligence is all about. It's about taking the time to stop, analyze, change your thought processes, and actually become a mentally healthy person. 
Yeah, the Lord said to Elijah when he was distressed, what doest thou here? Yes. In other words, stop, analyze. What is it that got you here? What are your thoughts? And that was the process that started his improvement. And that is a point where we're going to stop because we're out of time. And I think, Dr. Nedley, you have encapsulated everything in just those few moments, that there is hope and that there is a way out. And Dr. Nedley, as we close out this series, Depression, The Way Out, I think I would find it a privilege if you would pray for our audience on this subject. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the interest that you have in our health of body, mind, and soul. And just like your desire for Elijah to improve and for Michaela to improve, you desire each viewer here to live an emotionally satisfying, fulfilled, and successful life. And so we pray, Lord, that you might assist them and they might look to you for strength as well as these simple principles that we have been talking about, practicing in their life what Elijah and Solomon and others and Michaela have had to practice so that they can not only live a life more abundantly, but a life that is, has an infectious, positive influence on others. We thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name.